This video should help you revise the practical where you investigated digestive activity in germinating seeds. As always, the video will contain the examination material and added extras, and I hop in and out of other chapters just to help you revise. Remember to keep the toe dipped into all those other chapters, if not, you will forget the content and it's all linked. Shortly after seeds are formed, they enter this period which is known as dormancy. Dormancy is this period of reduced metabolic activity, where the seed will undergo no growth. So the seed is in shutdown and that embryo plant within the seed is catching those eggs, waiting for optimal conditions so that it can germinate and begin to regrow. Dormancy commenced with the seed losing most of its water content. That's the reason why seeds are very dry and hard. Dormancy has very important benefits to seeds. Firstly, dormancy gives the seed time for dispersal. Remember, the seed needs to get as far away from the parent plant as possible. If not, it will be in competition with its parent plant. Dormancy also allows time for that embryo plant to mature. Dormancy is a way of avoiding harsh weather. It ensures that the seedling has a better chance of survival because it simply will not germinate in harsh, cold conditions. Dormancy ensures a seed bank of a particular type of seed. It ensures that there will always be some of that seed around. Sow a handful of seeds in your back garden and you will notice that some of the seeds do not germinate. They remain dormant and may possibly germinate the following year. And this ensures that there is always a seed bank. Remember that some seeds can remain dormant for very long periods of time, some of them thousands of years. So what maintains this dormancy? What keeps the seeds dormant? The presence of particular growth inhibitors can be responsible for maintaining dormancy. For example, abscisic acid. This maintains dormancy in some seeds. And just a bit of revision, abscisic acid is a growth inhibitor and it's known as the stress plant hormone. It basically is responsible for the stomata closing in times of drought. More often than not, what maintains dormancy is a tough, impenetrable testa. It's a testa that simply is so tough, oxygen and water cannot enter. So how is dormancy eventually broken? One way is to soak your seeds in water. This softens the testa and it allows water and oxygen to enter. This happens naturally out in the fields with rainfall. The testa of some seeds is so tough that the only way to soften it is by passing it through the digestive system of certain birds and animals where the hydrochloric acid in the stomach will soften it. In countries prone to bushfires, for example, like Australia, some of their plants will, their seeds will remain dormant until such time as there's a bushfire where the extreme heat and the chemicals contained in the smoke of the fires, well, they will play a role in breaking the dormancy of the seeds. In many cases, it takes a period of extreme cold to break dormancy. Dormancy has been successfully broken and germination of the seed can commence. This is the regrowth of the embryo plant following that period of dormancy. And for germination to take place, three factors are essential. Water, oxygen and a suitable temperature. Let's go over why water is important. Water is responsible for softening that tough testa. This basically allows oxygen to enter and it also allows water, more water to enter the seed so that it can go into the cytoplasm of those cells. For your course, it's most important that you state that the water is responsible for activating enzymes contained within the seed. Enzymes such as proteases that break down proteins, lipases that break down lipids and amylases which break down starch. So the proteases are going to break down those proteins to amino acids and they're going to be used to make enzymes. The lipases are going to convert the lipids into triglycerides and they'll be used to provide energy. The amylases in the seed, well, they're going to break down the starch to maltose and this eventually gets broken down to glucose and glucose is needed for new cell walls and for cellular respiration. You have to understand that the enzymes that have been activated are breaking down the food reserves in the seed into smaller, more soluble subunits and these are being passed to the embryo plant and it's using them to grow. This practical investigating digestive activity in germinating seeds, well, it's all linked to those enzymes and the food reserves in the seeds. So how are we going to prove digestive activity in a germinating seed? Well, you're going to test for starch. 
Remember, those amylases in that germinating seed are going to convert the starch to maltose and that eventually gets converted to glucose. To commence the practical, we soaked some broad bean seeds in water. This was to soften the tester, so to break dormancy. We selected four seeds, two of which we boiled. These acted as the control, the non-living seeds. And the other two we simply set aside. These were your live seeds. Preventing contamination was paramount to the practical, so the seeds were soaked in sterilizing fluid and the implements and the desks were also washed down and cleaned with sterilizing fluid. Using sterile backed blades, each of the four seeds were cut in half. These seeds were transferred to the agar plates using flamed forceps, forceps that had been passed over the Bunsen flame briefly to kill any possible contaminants. Using aseptic technique, this means we wore gloves, we used sterile implements, we did not lift the lid fully off the petri dish, we transferred our seeds face down onto the agar. This was a very special type of agar, it was starch agar. Agar is a growth medium and it's a type of hard jelly and to this agar, starch was the nutrient that was added. Often in exams they'll ask you what was the nutrient added to the agar, it was starch. The practical is now all set up. You have two starch agar dishes with four seed halves. One set are live and one set are boiled. After securing the lids with parafilm, the dishes are placed in an incubator set anywhere between 20 and 30 degrees Celsius for 48 hours. After 48 hours, we remove the seeds. Both Petri dishes are flooded with iodine. And this is the result that you should get. Under the live seeds, there are white patches where the agar did not turn blue-black. As you can see on this plate, there are four white patches, which basically shows that there was no starch where these white patches occur. In contrast, the whole of the control plate was blue-black. There were no white patches, which means that the whole plate still had starch. Why was this? Why did this control plate have no white patches? The reason why there was no white patches on the boiled or the control is basically because there was no amylase activity. Those seeds had been boiled and boiling destroyed or denatured those amylase enzymes. So the starch remained underneath the seeds and this is why there were no white patches. Blue-black is a positive result for starch when flooded with iodine. As the boiled seeds were dead seeds and there was no enzyme activity, the whole plate tested positive for starch. Comparing these with the live seeds, which did contain those amylase enzymes, the amylase broke down the starch directly beneath the seeds and this resulted in a negative result for starch. What about those two other factors necessary for germination? Well, there's oxygen and it's needed for cellular respiration. Don't forget the hand of Krebs. And what about the suitable temperature? Most of the reactions within the seed are enzyme controlled and enzymes in plants have an optimal range of between 20 and 30 degrees Celsius. The following material is very exam specific material. It seems to appear very frequently on the papers, either in diagrams or as short questions. So what's a cotyledon? It's an embryonic seed leaf. And in dicots, there are two cotyledons, such as in the broad bean seed. What are the parts of the embryo plant? The first part is the cotyledon, the embryonic seed leaf, and seeds, if they're dicots, have two, and if they're monocots, they have one. The part of the embryo plant above where the cotyledons attach is known as the epicotyl. The growing tip of this is the plumule, and this is what will form the shoot of the new plant. The part of the embryo plant below where the cotyledons attach is known as the hypocotyl. The end of this, or the growing tip of this, is known as the radical, and this will form the root. Maize is an example of a monocot seed. It is a monocot because it has one cotyledon. It also has an endosperm, so it's known as endospermic. This is where it stores its food reserves. In dicots, they don't have any endosperms. They have two cotyledons, and this is where they store their food. So I'm sure you're absolutely fed up now with science and revision and exams and mock exams. So let's just escape for a few minutes and let's tune in to Louis Schwartzberg, his TED Talks. This man is a creative genius, in my opinion. His work is simply beautiful. If you really want to escape, well then tune in to either of these two TED Talks. They're simply just fabulous.